Yves Merch is a former governor of the Central Bank of Luxembourg and for eight years was on the executive board of the European Central Bank, the ECB. I wanted to find out how he sees crypto in relation to more conventional money, especially in terms of regulation, and what he thinks about Bitcoin SV. You're listening to CoinGeek Conversations with Charles Miller. So, Eve, we're going to talk a little bit about regulation of the crypto world. Uh, but before we get on to that, I wanted to ask from uh, an ECB point of view, what do you think uh, are the potential advantages of crypto? Or is it all negative? What, 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 might, what good might come of all this? Well, let me start by saying I do not represent the ECB anymore since my retirement. Uh, but I think you have a pretty good idea of the I thinking. I still but have some uh, feeling uh, what uh, is uh, the thinking uh, in the world of uh, supervisors, uh, but also in the world of central bankers above all. And uh, as such, uh, we do not have a mandate as a regulator. We uh, have uh, a mandate uh, to defend uh, a currency which uh, is supposed to be stable. And that is our only and first mandate, and that uh, we will defend. Part of this mandate uh, of a central bank also mentions that the central bank is to support um, safe and efficient payment systems because they are part uh, of the so-called transmission mechanism and um, they uh, ought also make sure that you have uh, a sure and efficient um, understanding of the monetary signals of the central bank. So uh, from that point of view, uh, we always consider innovation in the financial area as something basically positive because we are supposed to work in a functioning market economy and a market economy is to strive for a technological advance in order to improve competitiveness, which is supporting growth. And uh, that is why as a starting point, uh, any innovation is to be viewed positively. But then we have all the ways to analyze what are the potential benefits uh, for society at large and for the institution and what are the risks that come with these benefits. And then you have to uh, balance the two and you see to what extent uh, you will make use of it and to what extent uh, you will leave it to other agencies maybe to come in. But is the crypto world different from other uh, financial innovations that might have to be considered in that it's a global uh, product that is sort of all potentially uncontrollable. It, it, it's quite an outlier, I guess, isn't it? Uh, to the extent uh, that you rely on a technology which is highly decentralized and uh, where you have, uh, as I uh, mentioned uh, in my speech, that you have uh, risks which also are risks that you find in the traditional financial world, but uh, which are more uh, coming to the forefront in the crypto world, which on top of liquidity risk, leverage risk, uh, concentration risk, uh, um, sees that uh, there is also uh, governance risk, in so far that uh, you do not have a single responsibility you don't have a liability on the balance sheet uh, that you can go to court and claim against someone in. And from that point of view, it is uh, a little bit different from the traditional world. But on top of these governance issues, you then still have the traditional risks that come in every financial instrument. You also talked about the need for effective regulation to really be world regulation that that it's no good if some jurisdiction doesn't sign up to it because then you haven't really got control of the the, the cryptocurrency anyway then even if everybody else wants wants that kind of regulation unfortunately this is very difficult we try to have at the 
stage, let's say, of the Financial Stability Board, the G20, G7, uh, the uh, Basel Committee on Banking Supervision, uh, but they don't issue regulation, they make recommendations, they issue reports, and then they invite their jurisdictions to implement it in their national legislation as closely as possible. But there will not be a world regulation. But what can be done is to have an approximation of standards uh, so that you can accept uh, someone who offers services outside the territory to let it into the territory. In the absence of such a level playing field, there will obviously be attempts by jurisdictions of protecting their consumers and there will not be cross-border services being offered unless there is an established uh, license inside the jurisdiction, or there is a supervision that is recognized as equivalent uh, by the jurisdiction's uh, supervisor. Because you also use the phrase monetary sovereignty, and I guess that's the, the sort of the other side of that coin, which is that any particular jurisdiction actually doesn't want to be told what to do by the European Central Bank or anybody else, that they want to make their own decisions well, about it. Especially if some of these new incomers uh, of financial services have uh, such a potential of becoming systemic due to their enormous client base uh, that the big techs have, they could, uh, in theory, um, through their instruments, influence monetary policy in so far that uh, they have uh, stable coins that uh, have reserves and the reserves uh, are not disclosed properly. They are not standardized in their disclosure. They are not audited uh, for the moment. Uh, so that is why regulation has to come in, also to protect the consumers for redemption. But that is consumer protection. The monetary sovereignty comes to the part that most of these reserves assets will be invested in the monetary market. And the monetary market uh, will then have in its price formation uh, an influence by those big players. And that could distort also the uh, monetary policy transmission mechanism. And since those players don't have access to the central bank, and we do not give, have any intention to give them access to central bank. Uh, they cannot create liquidity, but depend uh, for their liquidity funding uh, to other uh, intermediaries. And thereby, they can be a big disturbance for the monetary transmission mechanism. Yeah, so if, um, say, a big tech company wants to invent its own cryptocurrency and it becomes incredibly successful, that yes. creates a whole new set of problems for governments, yes. I guess, because they can't tax it or it's, it's outside of their jurisdiction in a way. Not entirely in so far that they are in payments. Um, the central banks uh, are the overseer of payment systems. And in the new piece of uh, MICA regulation in the European Euro uh, Union, the central banks can voice their concern if there would be any such uh, concern because they could affect their balance sheet. Just remind us what MICA stands for again, would you? That is the markets in crypto assets. Right. Shortening for market in crypto assets. Uh, and uh, central banks could then voice uh, their concern uh, when those uh, would get a license or require a license. They could uh, suggest to have specific uh, arrangements um, or constraints uh, being imposed uh, in terms of capital requirements or in terms of uh, distribution, because they could affect the balance sheet of the banks. And the balance sheet of the central banks is about money creation, and it's uh, the counterpart of uh, the wealth of a nation. Right. I mean, it, would it, is it in the interests of central banks to get CBDCs, central bank digital currencies, going as, as a sort of a more controllable version of this new money? Uh, I would say uh, CBDC for the moment seems more to be a kind of uh, payment systems that is complementary to cash. Mm -hmm. And it is not meant to replace any existing financial instruments, but to maintain the uh, foot in the door that central banks have right now with cash in the system in the future with digital cash 
some, so to speak. And, uh, and do you think that it will be possible to tell people that CBDCs are just meant as a payment system and so don't save a lot of money on CBDCs, well, for instance? Uh, it is easy to tell people, especially in Europe, because we don't have a pan-European uh, payment system. So we rely on uh, foreign uh, payment systems. Uh, and uh, in Europe, uh, most payment systems are national. If you cross border, you cannot use your national payment system in another country. So from that point of view, it will be very easy to uh, make people understand that the uh, central bank uh, asset is usable cross-border and is a true pan-European system. But we don't want also to displace the banks. So this is only a platform on which banks can continue to add their own additional services as they do right now. But it will be a pan-European platform. So uh, it is also by no means already a done decision that uh, this central bank digital currency will be issued. In the Fed, there is uh, discussions, as far as I understood, uh, in a country where cash has virtually disappeared, like Sweden, when uh, only 5% of transactions are being done in their national currency, I think the central bank seems to be more favorable, the parliament seems to be more doubtful, at the euro area, they are right now only in an investigation phase to determine what could be the different features and uh, what would be the central bank digital currency and what would it not be. They're going to do a test run now, aren't they? No, the test is not yet decided even. The test uh, will only be decided upon in the next stage. For the moment, the investigation phase runs until let's say probably October, and then the governing council of the ECB will decide whether they go into the pilot or the test phase. And this test phase could again run uh, over two or three years. That depends on how many uh, options will be tested. And afterwards, it is still not a decision whether to roll Sorry. out, but it will be a further decision down the road whether to roll this uh, out. But I would say, from my point of view, the most important is to show the public that the central bank is ready for the digital age and that the central bank insists on having a pan-European payment system. And the European banks so far have not been able to live up to their promises and create a private pan-European payment system that is truly pan-European. So do you personally hope that this goes ahead and are, are kind of optimistic about it or are you more worried than optimistic? No, I'm not worried at all. Uh, whether I'm optimistic, uh, I think uh, that depends also on the legislator, because before you can decide on a digital currency, you need some feedback from the legislator on legal tender. If this digital currency would not be legal tender, then, uh, of course, it would be uh, undercutting such a project because the central bank cannot issue one currency that is legal tender, another that is not, uh, there will immediately be dual uh, exchange rates between the two right. or trade-offs. So, uh, Just widening back again to the, the broader cryptocurrency world, um, a committee of MPs, I expect you've heard in Westminster, recommended that the crypto should be regulated uh, like gambling, that they really had so little faith in it that the financial conduct authorities should have it removed from its responsibilities and that it should really be just treated like part of the gambling world. What's your feeling about that? You could see some of the existing traditional financial world uh, also as quite close to gambling <laughs> right. from that point of view. So uh, we in Europe, uh, we have always said, same risk, same rules. And that is what we try to apply. And whether the underlying technology uh, is uh, different or not, uh, I think uh, we look at it from the point of view of the objective to protect the market integrity, the consumer, the investor, but also financial stability at large and monetary transmission mechanism and monetary sovereignty. Right. Because we would not want to have a foreign cryptocurrency uh, starting to displace uh, our national currency or our European currency, uh, and that is what I call monetary sovereignty, because we would not have the option to deliver it to our citizens.
Right. So it, it really is a question of how to maintain control over the money, I guess. Yes. We're at the London Blockchain Conference uh, here, and you, you addressed it this morning. This is a conference that supports the Bitcoin SV blockchain. And a lot of talk here, as you probably come across, is about data going on the blockchain and not really the financial aspect of the value of Bitcoin SV. Is that a distinction that you and your former colleagues will be interested in? Or, or do you think Bitcoin SV will just get lumped with all these other cryptocurrencies and, and nobody will understand that distinction? No, uh, a precondition uh, for a regulation that is proportionate is uh, to have a proper access to data in order to have uh, comparability and uh, to make uh, educated uh, estimates on where you put your uh, your money in. And from that point of view, we uh, see that this is a world where for the moment uh, most of the uh, data are opaque, are not disclosed, are not disclosed in a standardized way, are not uh, disclosed and audited by a trusted third party. And all this uh, is undermining the trust um, in uh, new instruments uh, that nevertheless uh, could offer the perspective of having safer and cheaper uh, functions uh, than comparable instruments in the traditional world. And but, then we would not allow them. But if Bitcoin SV is simply a blockchain that large companies use to store data on and the average consumer has nothing to do with, would it then move outside of the purview of these regulatory uh, discussions, do you think? No, uh, because access to a system and entrance to a system are part of the oversight of payment systems. And we would also like to see where is the risk located and who is liable uh, for the risk. And uh, artificial uh, separation or segregation uh, will not do the trick. Um, we need access to the data and the data provider could, even in the banking system, partly be outsourced. But it must always be under the control of the uh, provider of services. And do you think there is a role for the courts in clarifying these responsibilities? Will we need a whole series of cases that can then be cited to show really where the delineations of, of these legal matters really lie? Obviously, uh, if you have a new set of regulations, it will always be tested in courts, especially if the incumbents or the newcomers uh, have uh, a large uh, army of lawyers at their disposal. <laughs> right. Well, Eve, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much for, Thank you for, for, having for, me, yeah. for, for coming on today. Thank Got you. It. Thanks very much to Eve Merch. Well, that's the last of my interviews from the London Blockchain Conference. Thanks to all my guests who I met there. Please join me next week for something different. Until then, thanks for listening and goodbye. Hey everybody, I'm Kurt Walker Jr. Join us live on Tuesdays at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time where you can ask me questions, comments, blessings, cursing, scrapes, gripes, or gropes. You can catch us live across CoinGeeks, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and probably a whole bunch of other places too. I think the big thing here, the big innovation, is the Ordinal's numbering system. So utility is driven by this whole idea of springboarding us in terms of innovation by using micropayments and unlocking all these different new ways of doing things. Decentralization, the meme, as people think of it, I don't think exists at all, anywhere. Bitcoin mining, Bitcoin wallet, blockchain, stablecoins, MetaNet, the evolution of money. 
Everybody is talking about Bitcoin today. But what exactly is it? Learn the basics from experts. Learn what Bitcoin is, how it works, and why it matters. Blockchain 101, your ultimate guide to the fundamentals of blockchain.